journalists, reporting in a foreign country can not only bring discomfort, but can even be dangerous, and some threats may not be immediately obvious. For the foreign correspondent, it's important to have someone by your side who not only knows the lay of the land, but the customs and cultures of that particular region. Joining me today over the phone is Moses Mabunga, a fixer in Kampala, Uganda. Thank you for joining me, Moses. You're welcome. So not only are you a fixer, but you're a translator, field researcher, and the CEO and founder of the research staffing agency, which assists media programs in East Africa. Specifically in Uganda, why is it important for foreign correspondents to have access to a fixer? Well, to be honest, in, in in Uganda and I guess in many developing countries, systems are, are really non-existent. It's important for someone who's coming from outside to work with someone that has local knowledge of the situation in the country. That local knowledge, how to navigate those various challenges and make sure that uh, a project is successful. You worked on a documentary called Call Me Kuchu, which focuses on Uganda's first openly gay man who was murdered while fighting the new anti-homosexuality bill. So Uganda has an especially conservative culture. Did you run into any problems at all while working on this project? <laughs> yes, I did. I had to attend uh, an event where some of the activists were, you know, they were basically saying enough was enough. Most people had identified me as a as a gay activist and uh <laughs> I, I i got some comments and i i could perhaps say we are not very kind like you mentioned in uganda being associated with the homosexual community can unfortunately bring unwanted attention or trouble which you learned firsthand so how do you help your team avoid that kind of danger first and foremost well we still have some old laws which, which still make it illegal for homosexuals to, to live openly as gay people. But then the new law had come up with, uh, with uh, several new clauses which would have made it illegal for people like me to, to work with uh, people from outside the country on, on LGBT issues. Mm -hmm. So um, to navigate that, you just give the authorities a broad picture of what you want to do but you do not go into the specifics. But uh, at the same time, you're not really telling a lie. Right. And uh, what other countries or regions have you worked in? And um, speaking of issues and covering within those borders, is there any difficulty moving between them or even within the countries? I've worked in Tanzania and I've worked in Rwanda. The only challenge that I observed in Rwanda was that I think because of the genocide that happened there, and uh, because of this perception that the West just looked on as the Rwandans killed each other, that I got a feeling that that suspicion has not really gone away. Mm. Yeah. And there are also regions, um, as you know, nearby, like South Sudan and Congo, where there is plenty of civil unrest. So do you take opportunities to work in these regions? Uh, at the moment, I'm not taking opportunities in, uh, in South Sudan and the Congo because of the current political situation in those countries. South Sudan is, is just impossible to work there right now. And uh, the same applies to Congo, where there's so many Ugandan rebels who are based there. The, the risk of being uh, misunderstood as someone who is perhaps a collaborator, you know, someone who is working in some capacity with rebels, or the risk is just too high. And, uh, and it's not worth it, to be honest. I mean, it's clear that it's not easy to report in these regions. Earlier this year, police intercepted and pepper sprayed journalists in Kampala. So how do you mediate intervention from police or even local government? Well, uh, it's really a delicate situation because what happens is uh, many people say that the police is pro-government most security agencies are pro-government. So if you engage in a, uh, in a project or if you're covering, uh, for example, you know, where people are rioting and uh, the majority of them are from what is perceived to be the opposition, then you can easily be caught in the, in the crossfire uh, very easily. So it's mostly just taking precautions, really, because things change really quickly. So you just have to take a little bit of, uh, you know, extra precaution. Right. 
And um, just to get your unique perspective on this, so stories about Boko Haram and Ebola, these are things that have received significant coverage this year. Do you think African stories have enough coverage by Western media? Well, I, if, if you're asking for my opinion, then I'll, I'll probably say yes. Uh, however, I will, be, uh, I will be quick to add that uh, the stories, are, the African stories are covered selectively because you'll find that some stories garner more media attention more than others. Um, if, if you look at what's happening with the Boko Haram guys in, uh, in Nigeria, around the same time that an attack took place in Paris, some people say as much as 2,000 people were killed in Nigeria. Okay, I'm sorry to use this word, but just 17 or so people were killed in, uh, in Paris. But still, the, the media focused a lot more on Europe than, uh, than on Africa. But then, then again, maybe it's just me and the way I see it. Um, is there anything you can re recommend for Western media to even change? Uh -huh. Um, maybe covering, uh, you know, more positive stories because uh, as an African living in Africa, you, you see so much that is not reported that you perhaps want to see. Uh, I, I think I'd love to see more of those. Mm -hmm. um, let's get into a little bit more of the specifics of your job. As for getting in touch with your clients, you do have a website and a profile on a Fixer database, but it seems like a lot of the Fixer network is promoted predominantly through word of mouth. So why is that? Is there some sort of preference for maintaining a low profile when being a Fixer? Fixers have a very niche market, I would say. So it's not a very big market. Being a good fixer requires very specific qualities, I would say, uh, as you need to be able to, to, to understand things very quickly and to, un and to you know, be able to read and understand situations really quickly and, and react accordingly. You, you're doing multiple things at the same time. You're, you're the logistics guy, you're, you're maybe an assistant, you're a guide, you're brokering, brokering deals. It's really to do with the personality, and I think you find that more often than not, people prefer someone that has been recommended by a friend or a colleague who has done a good job uh, that, that they think is, uh, is dependable. If you want someone who is going to deliver, uh, but also, you know, keep the client safe, and, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, and especially with such a small fixer network, I can imagine it's that more, that much more valuable to find someone who's really good at the job. And from what I understand, the internet isn't the steadiest. I mean, even we had trouble connecting to you for this interview. So what do you suggest to reporters who are trying to file their work back home? <laughs> well, if the internet fails, then I guess it's uh, the old-fashioned way. Fax machines still work down here. The communication sector is, is largely liberal. What most reporters do, they tend to subscribe to various providers so that if one provider is having problems, then you just switch over to the, to the next. That's all very helpful information, especially if you're watching and looking to report in Uganda. That's Fixer Moses Mabanga talking to me. Thank you for joining me, Moses. Yes, sir. Thank you. If you're interested in foreign correspondence, we've got more videos just like this one available online on the JSource website. I'm Mariel Torrey Franca for the International Reporting Bureau based at Humber College. Thanks for watching.